I want to thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. You know, we exist as a church to help you experience all that Jesus is so that you can become all you were meant to be. So if the ministry of Crossroads Church has impacted you in any way, we'd love to hear about it. Let us know your story at mycrossroadschurch.com. You can also help us to continue sharing the hope of Jesus around the globe by investing into our ministry. To do so, simply visit us at mycrossroadschurch.com slash give or by downloading the My Crossroads app and selecting give. Thanks again for joining us and I hope you enjoy today's message. morning, Crossroads. We're so glad that you have joined us today. I don't know where you're at right now, whether you're sitting on a couch or you're in the kitchen washing dishes or you are set up in your bedroom. Maybe you're even joining us from a place of, of your work. But wherever you're at, I am glad that you're here today. For those of you that don't know me, maybe you're newer to this church family or you're joining us for the very first time. My name's Pastor Christina, and we're in the middle of a message series called Grow Through It. And essentially, uh, what the, the main idea of this uh, message series is that, you know, we're all finding ourselves in this very interesting season, the season that no one in our lifetime has ever been through before, uh, much uncertainty. There, there's so much that, that we're trying to figure out day by day. And for many of us, we found ourselves in this place of feeling like this is something that we have to go through. But what I would want to challenge you on is that this is not just a season that we're going to go through. This is a season that God has given us an opportunity to grow through. God wants to grow your character. He wants to grow your faith. He wants to grow your endurance. And he wants to do it through the challenges that you're facing. And so uh, I'm really excited to be bringing part three of this message. But before I go there, before I start, I do feel the strong urge to uh, make a major uh, clarification to some fake news that went down last Sunday. Um, you know, despite what was said, I just want everyone to know that I have nothing against Reese's or the people who consume it. Um, you know, I have the utmost respect for the Reese's Corporation. In fact, uh, my family has personally invested thousands of dollars into their products. And so I, I applaud Reese's for making so many people happy over the years, including my people. And, you know, I I just want to say that that as we're talking about this season of growth, that whether you are munching on your Reister bunnies or your Reister eggs or your Reese's Santas or your Reese's pumpkins or your Reese's peanut butter cups, your Reese's pieces, your Reese's gumbo, your Reese's kebabs, whatever you, you are munching down on, I just want you to know that you are surely going to grow as you eat it. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but in all seriousness, just saying, just saying, um, taking this to the heart of what God has for you in this season is that he does want you to grow through this. And by the way, with the whole Reese stuff, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, that means you haven't seen either of the past two messages in this series. So go back on YouTube and you can check out uh, those two messages and you can find out why um, I might get a little huffy and puffy when it comes to Reese's. <laughs> but anyway, let's get serious about the message. Let's, let's dive into God's word. You know, this is a season for the entire world. It's a global pandemic. You know, we're not just experiencing this in our hometown. This is happening all over the world, and we now have a stay-at-home order in place. And, and coupled with all of the enormity of this situation, you know, th there's so many complexities that, that we are are, are facing, whether it's the, the isolation and the, the being by ourselves, the social distancing, the loneliness that comes out of it for many people, the despair, the uncertainty. And, and we all, you know, even in the midst of all of this, we all have an opportunity to grow through it. We all have an opportunity 
to not just try to get through it, but to grow through it. And so, you know, I just, I, I want to, to encourage you during this time that, that you wouldn't be surprised when in this season of growth that we experience growing pains. When we experience those times when, when, when it hurts a little bit, you know, a lot of times in our spiritual growth, as, as we get closer to God, there's many times in our walk with God where we have wow moments, you know, it, where it's just amazing and his presence is so sweet and he seems to be speaking directly to us. But there are also not just the, the, the wow moments of this journey of faith that we can experience. There's a lot of ow moments. <laughs> There's a lot of times where, where growth is not easy. There's a lot of times when, when growth is actually painful. And I just have to say, nobody ever told you, nobody's ever said that growth is easy or pain-free. In fact, many times, growth is very, very difficult, and many times, it, it is painful. And I just want to encourage you that in this season, especially if you're experiencing the pains of growth, that growth is not something that I know we... we kind of sometimes wish that it would just happen. You know, we wish that growth was, was instinctive, that we would just, you know, like blossom and grow without any of the hard work. Growth is actually not something that happens instinctively. Growth is something that happens intentionally. Uh, growth has to be intentional, and here's why. Because what I found in life is that in all of the seasons of, of spiritual, emotional, mental growth in my life, they've always been coupled with seasons of pain and difficulty. See, in these seasons of difficulty, in these seasons that, that, that kind of press us a little harder, those are the seasons when we have an opportunity for growth. And I'm not just making this up. This is actually in the Bible, James chapter 1. This is the core verse for this series. Uh, and it says this, James chapter 1, verse 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has an opportunity, a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. For you know that when your faith is, is tested, you, your, and your endurance has a chance to grow. See, James is quite clear here. James is telling us that growth happens intentionally. We have to be intentional about our personal growth. And as we've mentioned over the past two weeks, in order for us to grow during this season, there are four questions that I want you to be asking of yourself. And if you haven't written, written these down yet, I would encourage you, grab something, write this down. The four questions during this season, for however long it's going to last in our day, I want you to be asking these four questions about your growth. Number one, how hungry am I? What is the desire in my heart? What are the things that I'm chasing after? What am I wanting so much? I'm hungry for it. I have a desire for it. That was week one. Number two, and Pastor Joel did such a phenomenal job last week uh, asking this question, how is my heart? What is the condition of my heart? Uh, uh, because the Bible says that everything flows from the condition of our heart. Everything that we do in life flows out of our hearts. And so it's very important that if we want to grow, that our heart has to be healthy. How is my heart? Question number three, and this is the one that we're going to be covering today, and that is what are my habits? What are my habits? What are the things that I am doing intentionally on a consistent basis to ensure that growth happens? And finally, next week, we're going to be covering the question, who can I help? Four important questions, and I hope that you are starting to catch the intentionality uh, from which we're building um, week after week after week. The, the intentionality and the order of these questions, the order uh, of going from your, your um, hunger to your heart, to your habits, and then being able to help others. There, there's, uh, we're, we're going somewhere with this, I promise. See, if we're not hungry for growth, then we won't care about the condition of our heart. 
And if the condition of our heart is, is in an unhealthy place, then we will never have what it takes to develop healthy habits that will allow us and to set us up to be able to help the world in need. They all go together. We need this hunger to want to grow, and we need a healthy heart to grow. We need to develop habits to grow, and if we really want to grow, we're going to find our greatest source of growth is when we're making a difference in the lives of others and we're helping. Now today, the title of my message is this, Habits of a Healthy Heart habits of a healthy heart. I really want to take uh, Pastor Joel's message from last week and build on it, springboard off of it as we talk about three essential habits that are going to allow, that's going to allow your heart to become healthy and grow. I want to read from Psalm 119, and we're going to start uh, with verse 112. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, so that's why uh, we're at verse 112. And it says this, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. I want to read that one more time. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever until the very end. The psalmist says forever until the very end. I, I want this to last. What I'm building, I want it to last. I want this to last through the quarantine. I want this to last through the pandemic. Beyond all that we're facing right now, what I am building, the growth that's happening in my life, I want to build it in such a way that it will last forever. He also says, I have inclined my heart. I've inclined my heart. See, this growth has to happen from within. It has to start from inside of us. This is not just the behavior, the, ha the, the behavior that happens when we form habits. This is the belief that drives our behavior. behavior. See, see we, we, if we are wanting this change, if we are wanting this growth in our lives, if we're wanting to not stay where we're at, then we have to have change that comes from within. <coughs> Allergies, I promise. <laughs> I have inclined my heart. Now think about it. I have inclined my heart. What does it mean to incline? To incline is actually a repositioning. It, it's a resetting of the position of, of, of where your heart's at. I've inclined. I've inclined, and this is something that's happening within. Inclining is changing the direction of where you're facing. As I incline my heart, you know, a lot of us throughout this time in this season of social distancing and isolation and, and the fear and the uncertain, uncertainty of these days is that, that the position of our heart has actually been in a decline. The position in, of our heart maybe has even been in a recline. How many of you have been getting good use out of your uh, lazy boy chair? <laughs> We've been in this recline. And, and what the psalmist is encouraging us to do is to incline our heart, to set our heart on things above, to incline our gaze, to incline our focus, that, that we are not just focusing on what's in front of us, but what is above us. That Jesus is the source, that Jesus has everything that I need in this season. See, the psalmist said, I have inclined my heart. I, I have inclined my heart. I'm not waiting for anyone else to lift my head. I'm not waiting for, for someone to encourage me to do it. I have been intentional about inclining my heart. I have set my heart in the right direction. I have decided that I'm going to be intentional about inclining my heart. And I don't just wish that it would happen. You can't just wish that your heart would incline. We actually have to be intentional, head up, that we are face up. God, I look to you. I, I think about that song, God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. 
And you know, things, faith come at us, whether, whether you're, you, you get up to have a quiet time in the morning, your head is up, you just had an incredible Sunday morning, you know, you, you've been to church, you got to worship and your head is up and, and, and then you hear a crash in the kitchen <laughs> and then you discover your internet's not working and then you get into a fight with your spouse and then everything goes to pot and before you know it, where are you facing? Are, is your heart inclined to heaven or is it in a decline again? See, the psalmist, he has something so important for us here is that he inclined his heart. He positioned his heart upward. He positioned his heart in a way that was inclined to the throne room of heaven. See, what's going to happen is things are going to come at us. And before we know it, despair and loneliness and anger, and that all comes at us. It all sets in. And there is going to come a time when we need to take charge of our heart. I'm going to say that again. There is going to come a time, family, when we need to take charge of our heart, that we need to tell our heart where it needs to look. That, that everything within us wants to look at the circumstance. Everything within us wants to look at what's going wrong. But we need to take charge of our heart and incline it in the right direction. He says, he goes on to say in, in verse 113, the psalmist says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. What he's saying here is I hate double-mindedness. I, I hate this. I hate the back and forth. I hate the wishy-washy. I hate the here one moment and gone the next. I, I hate the Indian givers. I, I hate the people that talk out of both sides of their mouth. I, I hate the people who say one thing and do the other. I hate double-mindedness. And, and you know what one of the biggest motivations that will help us to grow, that help us to push towards change and push towards the right direction is a hatred for the right things. Hating the right thing. See, the psalmist says, I hate this double-mindedness, this wishy-washy religion, this back and forth. I hate the double-mindedness. And, and it's very important. The very first healthy habit that I want to talk about today is to learn what to hate. Learn what to hate. See, it usually comes down to the things that we have this love-hate relationship with that cause us to move into action, that cause us to grow. And, and, and see, I, I think about, you know, th this, this goes across the board. You know, there are many times that, that I love the way I feel after I work out. I love the endorphins raised. I love the way I feel when I've accomplished something that's really difficult. I love how I feel after the workout, but I hate and I repeat, hate the way I feel during the workout. I don't like being out of breath. I don't like it when my muscles are burning. I don't like it when I feel like my legs could literally drop from under me. I don't like the way I feel in the middle of it. I love, though, the way I feel when it's all over. Love-hate relationship. <laughs> I, you know, I love, I love a good comfort bowl of rigatoni bolognese. I'm Italian. I love my pasta. And I can devour a, a big old bowl of pasta. And I love the way it tastes in my mouth. I love the smell of it. I love everything about carbs and pasta. I love it. I don't necessarily love, in fact, I probably hate what it does to me the next day. See, see, there are so many things that, that may feel good in the moment. It may feel good and right now, but, but it doesn't feel good when all is said and done and vice versa. You know, self-pity, self-pity feels pretty darn good when someone's wronged me, when someone I love or care about has hurt me or betrayed me. Self-pity feels pretty darn good, but I, I, I love to, to be in that place of self-pity when it happens, but what I don't love, in fact, what I hate is when self-pity traps me into a place of despair and bitterness. I, I hate that. 
I hate that. I, I, I love the taste of self-pity, but I hate the outcome. I love the taste of it, but I hate the outcome. See, there is a healthy way to hate. You may be thinking, well, Christina, that's not biblical. Oh, yes, it is. See, I hate racism. I hate it. I hate poverty. I hate human trafficking. And the only way for me to actually get off my rear end and do something about it is to hate it. There is a healthy way to hate. And until you have the outcome of what happens to your soul, more, unless you hate what happens to your soul more than the satisfaction that it gives you, that it gives your flesh in the moment, you will not grow a healthy heart. This is so important. I want to say it one more time. Until you hate the outcome of what happens to your soul more than the satisfaction that it gives your flesh in the moment, you will not grow a healthy heart. We need to train our brain. We need to take charge of our heart. We need to learn what to hate. We need to hate the right things. Instead of looking at a bowl of pasta and thinking, man, that looks so delicious. I can't wait to devour it because I just love pasta. Maybe I need to think about the outcome. And I need to hate the outcome that it will bring me. I'm not going to feel very good tomorrow. That's not going to look good if I eat too much of it. I, I don't like the fact that I can't control myself, that I just keep eating it. There, are, there is an outcome. It's often when we can hate the outcome of what sin produces in us. And, and if we can love the, the doing the right things and, and being focused and intentional about feeding ourselves the right things and hating the outcome of the wrong things, then we will begin to see growth in our lives. So if we want to develop these healthy habits of our heart, number one, we need to know what to hate. Number two is we need to know where to hide. We need to know where to hide. And, Chris, and you may be thinking right now, Christina, you, are you kidding me? I've been hiding for six weeks. I've been stuck at home. I, I've been in isolation. I haven't seen a human soul in so long. I have been in my shelter for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. But, but I'm not talking about that kind of a shelter. <laughs> I'm not talking about hiding in your home or a physical location. I'm actually talking about a place that you can hide that, that is not physical, but a place that you can hide inside. See, I don't know about you, but even though I have been safe at home, shelter in place, away from, you know, the, the uncertainty of this pandemic, and I, I've been hiding at home. I'm here to say that there have been a couple of times that I have had an emotional meltdown. <laughs> yeah. An emotional meltdown, a breakdown that I am not proud of. See, the problem is, is that even though I have this physical shelter and this physical place to hide inside, the inside is where I, I have not remembered that there is a safe place to hide, even in the midst of everything that we're going through. Do you know where to hide? Do you know where to run to when our world is in disarray? Do you know where to take your heart? Do you know where to hide your heart in times that we're facing right now? I'm, like I said, I'm not talking about a physical place. I'm not talking about the home that you live in. I'm not talking about a church building. I'm actually talking about a, a spiritual place that's inside of you, a, a place where, where, where we can truly be safe in any circumstance. See, Emotional states are typically the place that we run to when we find ourselves in distress. We naturally run into the, these emotional states. And unfortunately, even though we hide in these states of anger or self-pity or bitterness or offense or the victim mentality, even though we run to these emotional states, what we're going to find out is that these hiding places are not a place of safety. 
They're actually a place of self-destruction. Psalm, if we keep reading in Psalm 119, verse 114, it says, You are my hiding place. You are my shield. I hope in your word. See, the problem for most of us is that we look for a hiding place when the attacks come. We find ourselves in this place of, oh no, run for shelter. Where do I go? But then it's already too late. We run to the wrong places. The psalmist, however, he has found a safe place and he has already designated before the attacks come. He already knows where his safe place is. He already knows who his shield is. He already knows where to hide when things get hard. And we often run to places that seem safe in the moment, that seem right in the moment, that taste good in the moment, but, but they actually are not a place of safety. You know, for me personally, when, when I find that things are outside of my control, when, when things get crazy and hectic and, and, and overwhelming, do you want to know where I naturally run to? I, I wish that I could say that every time I run to the rock that is higher than I, that I intentionally set and incline, incline my gaze to heaven. But, but naturally, the place that I run to is self-loathing. I begin to have thoughts like I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. I'm not love worthy. I'm not worthy of love. I, I, I'm not good enough to receive love. That's where my heart goes naturally. But see, what, what the psalmist is, in, 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 is asking us to do is to already know where our safe place is. It is not that place that we naturally run to when disarray comes, when, when we are overwhelmed. You know, I run to self-loathing. Some of us run to blame. We immediately, when things go wrong, we immediately point the finger and we blame someone. Well, you know what? If you hadn't done X, Y, Z, then I wouldn't have hurt you so bad. Or some of us, you know, we, some of us run to porn or promiscuity or, or food or alcohol. Some of us actually run to this fake spirituality. We become this uber religious person and we have this mask of looking good on the outside, but inside we are crumbling and falling to pieces inside. And these things may seem safe in the moment, and they do hide us. Let me be very clear. These things do hide us from something. Unfortunately, they're not hiding us from the enemy. They're not hiding us from the attack. They're actually hiding us from the opportunity to grow and get better. When we hide ourselves in these emotional states or we hide ourselves in things like alcohol or porn or, or promiscuous relationships, we, we think we're, we're running to a place of safety. But what is actually happening is we're not hiding from the danger. We're hiding from God. And God wants to call us out from those places. And he wants to say that I am your place of safety. I am the shelter that you need to run to. I am the shield that will protect you during these difficult and uncertain times. I am going to be your protector. Run to me. Take refuge in me. And I want to call you out of hiding today. If you're hiding in any of those places, if you're hiding in a place that, that is not the most high God, the, the shelter, the refuge that, that it will keep us protected and safe in every single storm that we face. If you are hiding in a place of, of self-pity, unworthiness, despair, loneliness, depression, anxiety, if you are running to things like alcohol or pornography, if you are hiding in any of those places, listen to me, I want to call you out of hiding. And I say, come out of hiding and allow yourself to run to the shelter that will never fail you, that will protect you from danger. Take charge of your heart. Take charge of your heart. How do you do it? You incline your heart. You incline your heart. Go into a place of worship. Holy, 
There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. You worship. You, you remember who he is. You tilt your head back up. You incline your heart and you run to that place of safety. He is, the Bible says, he is the rock that is higher. He is that place that is higher that the floodwaters cannot get to. And if you feel like you are drowning in this season, lift up your head, incline your heart, and run to that place that is safe. The third habit of a healthy heart is this, and I'm going to close with this, is know how to hope. Know how to hope. A lot of us, when we think of hope, we think of hope as something that we have. We think of hope as something to obtain. You know, we start off the year 2020, the year of vision, perfect vision, and we, we start the year off 2020 with like, I have so much hope for the future. I have hope. We say we have hope as if, as if it's this thing, but, but biblically speaking, you know, when, when the psalmist is talking about having hope in the word of God, hope, if you, if you look at the actual meaning of the word hope, it is not an object. Hope is not a noun. Hope is actually a verb. And hope it, it is actually, um, if, you, if you look at the Hebrew meaning for the word hope, the, it is actually translated to wait, to hope means to wait it's not a wish hope is not a wish hope is to wait and i'm speaking to someone i know right now i know that there is someone hearing my voice in the pandemic of 2020 that that you uh, that you are 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 wishing that god would come through and what i want you to hear today is that he wants you to hope in him he wants you to wait on him to come through for you he wants you to wait and understand that his word will come to pass he wants you to wait on his promises until they are fulfilled he wants you to wait on the, the for for things that are not good to become good because listen if it's not better yet then he's not done yet he's still working he's still moving we need to hope in him it's a verb we need to hope we need to wait expectantly knowing that he's going to come through for us because he works all things together for the good of those who love him because he is making all things new because he will never leave us or forsake us because he is a firm foundation that cannot be shaken that even when the winds and the waves and the floods rise up against us if we are standing on his rock we are immovable unshakable because psalm 119 114 says you are my hiding place you are my shield i hope in your word and some of us today i don't know where you're at i don't know what you're dealing with i don't know what you've been running to to hide in again i want to call you out of hiding i know i'm speaking to someone right now I want to call you out of hiding under the wrong things and I want you to, I want to call you into a hiding place a firm foundation a strong refuge a mighty tower he is the rock that is higher than the situation that you're in right now he is a safe place he is a shield that will protect you from danger incline your heart right now I want to encourage you, incline your heart, look up to heaven, look up to God in your living room, in your kitchen, wherever you at, wherever you're at, I want you to have a moment with him right now. Incline your heart to him. Say, God, I look to you. You're where my hope comes from. I will hope in you. I will wait on you. I will wait with expectancy. I will trust you. You are faithful. You are good. 
You are my rock. You are my strong tower. I incline my heart to you. I'm going to be intentional today to incline my heart, to look to you, to run to you. And I don't want this just to be something that I do in this pandemic. I, God, I want this to, to last. I want this to go forever. I want, I want to incline my heart for years and years to come until my dying day. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your presence in this moment. And right now in this moment where you are speaking to hearts and you are changing lives right now, I want to speak to some of you here today. And you have never, ever been intentional to incline your heart to God in heaven. And he, I want you to hear this. God is reaching down. You may have not been intentional to reach up. He is reaching down to you right now. And he is extending out his hand and he is inviting you to come to him, to come into his family, to come into the safety of his kingdom, the safety of his home, the safety of his family, and he is inviting you to incline your heart, maybe for the first time, maybe it's been a really long time, and you know that you need to recommit to him. You need to recommit to running into his safe place. And if that's you today, I wanna encourage you to pray this prayer in your heart as I pray out loud, dear Jesus, Today, I incline my heart to you. I lift up my head. I lift up my heart. God, I'm going to establish these healthy habits. I, God, I'm going to learn. I'm going to know what to hate. I'm going to know where to hide. God, I'm going to put my hope in you. I'm going to trust you with my life, with my soul. Today, I acknowledge, I confess with my mouth that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. God, I need you today to come and to change me from the inside out. You are today the Lord of my life, and I will follow you for every day that is to come, not just during this difficult season, but even beyond that. I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. I choose today to follow you, Jesus, and make you Lord of my life. And it's in Jesus' name we said together, amen, amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, I want to congratulate you. It's the best decision that you could have made because now you have a place to run to. Now you have a place to incline your heart. Look to him, whatever you're facing. Now you have a place to run to. And I'm so proud of you. We want to get some resources into your hands. So um, they're online, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or on our online platform, there is a, a connect card available for you. Let us know on your connect card that you made a decision to follow him because we want to get some resources into your hands. We want to reach out to you and, and maybe pray for you today. So um, just let us know on the connect card that you made that decision and we'll be reaching out to you this week. Again, you guys, we love you. We miss you more than you can possibly imagine. And what a day, what a party we are going to have when we are back together again. But until then, we love you. We miss you. Stay uh, engaged as we continue with our encounter moments, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we will see you right back here for Church Online next Sunday, 9, 15, and 11. Love you guys. Bye-bye.